Okay, so this is uh, really exciting today. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anthony Chalmers. Uh, Anthony is the Chair of Clinical Oncology at uh, the Institute of Cancer Sciences, University of Glasgow. Uh, he went to Oxford Medical School, got his MRCP in 1995. He got his PhD in Radiation Biology at the University of London. So this makes uh, Anthony a true physician scientist. He's done some amazing work, both at the bench and the bedside, uh, predominantly in glioma, but also other tumors. Uh, as some of you know, he's uh, done a, a stunning amount of work in the phase one trial space, phase one and two trials, looking at DDR uh, inhibitors, uh, namely Olaparib. Uh, he's PI of a couple critical trials, Paradigm 1 and 2, and the operatic trial. Many of you know uh, the operatic trial from the slides that I always present about the phase zero and how he really was the first to show that laparib penetrates enhancing regions of the brain. Uh, in the laboratory, he's done some very, very important work dissecting out uh, key DDR nodes that are exploitable and clinically actionable. Uh, I also do share the distinct honor of almost getting kicked out of the MSK ASCO party with you. But if Antonio Moro is there, he would have saved us. Uh, but anyways, with that, uh, please welcome Dr. Chalmers. Really excited to hear about your work today. Oh, thank you very much, Ranjit, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many people in the audience. Um, so I'm going to talk predominantly about glioblastoma. Um, I'm a, what we call in the UK a clinical oncologist, so I'm dual trained in radiation oncology and medical oncology, um, which turns out to be a great advantage when we start trying to evaluate radiation drug combinations. So um, quick disclosures, um, as many of you will know, our ability to target tumors and avoid critical normal tissues has improved very significantly over the last decade. So it's a really exciting time to be working with radiation. And just to remind those of you who, who are not radiation oncologists, we can actually cure tumors with radiation therapy. Um, and what we are intending to do really as, as the overall aim of my research group in Glasgow is to tackle those patients who for whom radiation is not curative for whatever reason. So that would include GBM, lung cancers, pancreatic cancers, and some head and neck cancers. And one of the ways that we can do that is to combine radiation with some of the novel targeted agents that are available to us now. If we look at systemic uh, treatments for cancer, particularly the use of novel targeted agents, uh, there's an increasing trend to combine uh, one or two or even more agents together to try and overcome uh, resistance. But that approach, I think it's fair to say, has been um, associated with corresponding increase in systemic toxicity. It's a real barrier to the sort of intensification of treatment when we use systemic agents. So one of the reasons that I'm so interested and passionate about combining radiation with systemic agents is that we can get intensification of treatment at the tumor site. And we can really avoid some of these problems with multiplying systemic toxicities if we use radiation as one agent and then combine that with the correct systemic agent. So this is really my uh, career goal, is to increase the use of radiation drug combinations. Obviously, when we give radiation, we do cause some toxicity. And when we combine with drugs, we need to be very thoughtful about how that's going to affect the toxicities, because these toxicities are very different depending on what tumors we're treating and what part of the body they're in, obviously. Uh, we can divide them up predominantly into acute and late toxicities. So the acute toxicities we see in rapidly proliferating tissues. And you can see here the oral mucosa, the skin, the esophagus. These can be severe, but they are almost always reversible. And they're not usually dose limiting. In some contexts, they can be dose limiting, such as head and neck cancer, but in many, they are not, and they are reversible. So we would normally accept some increase in acute radiation toxicity if it led to an increased probability of cure. On the other hand, the late radiation side effects are observed in non-proliferating tissues. And if these occur, they're irreversible. So we really want to avoid these at all costs, and they always influence what dose of radiation we give. There are some examples here in the brain, the lung, and the skin, the subcutaneous tissues. We don't see these very often anymore. Our radiation techniques have got much better, but we're often treating at fairly close to the doses at which we would start to see these late toxicities. 
So there isn't much scope to increase them. So what we, if we're adding drugs to our radiation regimes, we do not want to increase the risks of late toxicities. My research, as Ranjit has told you, is focused largely on the DNA damage response. And there's a very simple reason for that, which is that radiotherapy predominantly kills cells by damaging their DNA. And apologies if this is a little simplistic, uh, but it's very important to recognize that the key types of damage to DNA induced by radiation are single-stranded breaks in DNA, and these are very abundant after radiation, and then double-strand breaks, which are far less common. But it's the double-strand breaks that will kill the cells if they are unrepaired. And that will be perhaps by apoptosis or very commonly by mitotic catastrophe. The cells have evolved quite sophisticated pathways to recognize and repair these types of damage. So it's really important to recognize that it's only the unrepaired double strand breaks that will kill the cell. And it looks like if a break is still unrepaired about 24 hours after induction, that's likely to be associated with death of the cell. So that's the backdrop. How are we going to exploit our understanding of DNA damage responses to try and improve outcomes for patients? So this slide I've kind of spent about two years developing. Uh, I'm still tweaking it, so any suggestions would be welcome. So we need to think about everything in terms of the cell cycle. We've obviously got mitosis here and S phase when the DNA is replicated in the middle here. So our single strand breaks are predominantly repaired by the base excision repair pathway, and that can function throughout the cell cycle. The double strand breaks are repaired by two pathways, one of which is non-homologous end joining, which is particularly critical in G1 phase of the cell cycle. And the other pathway is homologous recombination. This uses a sister chromatid as a template, so it can only occur once the cell has replicated its chromosomes. So it's very important in S phase, and it also functions in G2 phase. These repair pathways are backed up by cell cycle checkpoints. So the G1S checkpoint is there to stop cells from entering S phase if they've still got unrepaired DNA damage. Because we don't want the cell to replicate damaged DNA, could that exacerbate the problem? The G2M checkpoint is also very crucial. Could this stop cells with damaged DNA from entering mitosis? And if a cell attempts to physically divide, while still carrying unprepared double strand breaks, and it's very likely that that cell will die by mitotic catastrophe. So these work together to give the cell the maximum chance of repairing DNA damage and thus surviving after radiation. So this is the backdrop to think about how we're going to impact upon our normal tissues and our tumors if we inhibit some of these pathways. So as I mentioned, the late responding normal tissues, which are really crucial on dose limiting, consist predominantly of cells that are non-proliferating. So these cells are in G1 phase of the cell cycle. In contrast, most of the tumors that we try to cure with radiotherapy are rapidly proliferating. So those tumor cells will be distributed throughout the cell cycle. So there's a real difference here that we can perhaps try to exploit. Why are these tumor cells spread out throughout the cell cycle? Well, it's partly because most of them have lost their G1S checkpoint. That might be through a P53 mutation or other mutations in that pathway. We also know that tumor cells exhibit high levels of DNA replication stress, and they have evolved mechanisms of tolerating that stress, which we can perhaps exploit as well. And all these things together mean that tumor cells are particularly dependent on their G2M checkpoint to survive once we've treated them with radiation therapy. So we've got some opportunities now to intervene after radiation and promote tumor cell death while avoiding death of our normal tissue cells. And we have a lot of very good small molecules that can inhibit different components of these pathways. So DNAPK is a crucial part of non-homologous end joining. And if we inhibit DNAPK, we get a very marked radiosensitizing effect, which could perhaps be beneficial in terms of tumor control. But my view is that this would also carry a high risk of causing severe normal tissue damage. 
because these um, non-proliferating cells in the late responding normal tissues are dependent on non-homologous end joining to repair the double strand breaks because they can't use homologous recombination. So whilst this is a potent radiosensitizing drug, my view is that it would be perhaps not the best choice to get a tumor specific effect. On the other hand, if we were able to inhibit homologous recombination, we would predict that this would be tumor specific, certainly in terms of the late responding normal tissues, because they don't really use that pathway to repair double strand breaks. Unfortunately, as yet, no one's really been able to develop a homologous recombination inhibitor that works. So if you're into drug development, please make a homologous recombination inhibitor. You're all familiar with PARP inhibitors. We use them for the treatment of BRCA deficient ovarian and breast cancer. And if we inhibit PARP, we make basic scission repair much less effective and we affect uh, the repair of single strand breaks. I'm going to explain in a bit more detail later on why this is a tumor specific radiosensitizing effect. Uh, and I'll come back to that shortly. We have some other compounds which can target the replication stress tolerance mechanisms. So ATR inhibitors, CHECK1 inhibitors, and we have drugs like ATM and WE1 inhibitors that can target this G2M checkpoint, which as I mentioned, the tumor cells are particularly dependent on. So we've got a whole range of drugs now that we could combine with radiation. And for some of them, there's a clear rationale that that would be a tumor specific effect. Of note, when we're thinking about targeting ATM, which I'll talk about right at the end of my uh, session, uh, this also has a repair function uh, in double strand break repair, which makes uh, ATM inhibitors extremely potent radiosensitizers, which is exciting from a tumor perspective, but also we need to bear in mind potential impacts on the normal tissues. Okay, so that's the general landscape of DDR inhibitors when combined with radiation therapy. I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk on glioblastoma, which is, as you are all aware, a very uh, nasty tumor with a terrible prognosis. It's highly infiltrative. So even if the neurosurgeons are able to resect the majority of this contrast enhancing material, we know that the tumor margin regions around that will be infiltrated by tumor cells. And that's crucially functioning brain. We're never going to get a complete excision of a GBM. So radiation therapy is a crucial component of treatment because it can target tumor cells within this infiltrating unresectable region. And radiotherapy is a core component of the treatment for GBM. It is effective in that it approximately doubles survival from about six months to 12 months. But obviously, it's not a curative treatment because all of these patients will eventually recur. If we add temozolomide to radiotherapy, we get a modest improvement in survival, and that's giving temozolomide concomitantly throughout six weeks of radiotherapy and then for six cycles adjuvant. And we see something of a tail in the survival curve, particularly in MGMT methylated tumors, which are responsive to temozolomide. But overall, prognosis very poor and lots of scope to improve treatment. I talked about giving radiation doses close to the threshold of what the normal tissues can tolerate. Well, the brain is a perfect example of that. If we give 60 gray, for many patients it's tolerated, but for some it really is not tolerated. And this is an example from our own clinic, a 64-year-old lady who had a GBM resected, a really good operation, very little disease left, and then underwent chemo radiation. We would have irradiated a volume approximately three centimeters in all directions around this small cavity. So this lady was um, very well at the time of starting her radiation. 18 months later, the tumor was well controlled, but the lady had dementia and was in a nursing home. Uh, so this is an example, an extreme example of adverse response to radiation in the normal brain. Uh, with very marked cerebral atrophy. So clearly this lady had some underlying predisposition to this, which we don't really understand, but it's just to emphasize the point that if we intensify our radiation therapy, we must not increase the effect on the normal brain because those consequences are catastrophic. One way that we give better radiotherapy is by targeting it better. 
and the adoption of IMRT for GBM and other brain tumors has been very helpful in giving us much better conformality around our target volume. The different doses of radiation are shown in different colors with red being 100% of the dose. And you can see we get better sparing of the contralateral hemisphere if we use IMRT. But this alone is not sufficient to cure any of these tumors. It does, however, make it a little bit easy for us, easier for us to add in additional therapies. So this paper came out 12 years ago now uh, and had a big impact on the field. I'd already been studying uh, PARP inhibitors for a while, uh, but this paper described this population of stem-like cells within glioma, which are responsible for, uh, firstly, resistance to therapies, including radiation, and then subsequently for initiating the recurrent tumor. And what Jeremy Rich's group showed was that the resistance of this population of cells was driven by upregulation of their DNA damage response. And so since then, my lab's been studying three questions associated with that observation. The first is, why are these GBM stem-like cells radioresistant? The second is, can we target that phenotype uh, and overcome treatment resistance by inhibiting the DNA damage response? And then more recently, addressing the question of which patients will specifically benefit from adding which DDR inhibitors to radiotherapy. And I'll say right now, we have a long way to go in this third question, but I'll show you some data uh, for these two. So we developed some models in the lab. These are primary GBM cells, which immediately on uh, resecting the tissue from the patient are cultured in media that preserve the stem cell phenotype. And so these we call our GSCs, glioma stem-like cells. And these are very radio resistant, which is what Jeremy Rich's group had seen. If we then take those cells and culture them in medium that pr promotes differentiation and depletion of that stem-like population, we get a slightly more radiosensitive population. And we call these the differentiated or bulk cells. The stem-like cells show high expression of a whole range of DDR proteins like CHEK1 and ATR, and also baseline phosphorylation of those proteins. So even in the absence of a DNA damaging agent, those cells seem to have switched on their DNA damage response as if waiting for some challenge which they're going to respond to. We characterize that in some detail. And if we look at double strand break repair with gamma H2X foci, the stem cells are in pink, the non-stem cells in blue. We see induction of double strand breaks after radiation. And at early time points, the repair is the same. But at late time points, we see a small but significant difference where the stem cells have repaired the vast majority of the double strand breaks, but the non-stem cells have a small but significant unrepaired population. And we know that these small differences in unrepaired double strand breaks at 24 hours do translate into a difference in radiosensitivity. We also looked at the G2M checkpoint function. Jeremy Rich's group had shown up regulation of these proteins but hadn't looked at whether that actually impacted on checkpoint function. So looking at the G2M checkpoint by looking at the percentage of mitotic cells and the impact of radiation on that, we see that the stem-like cells show a very robust activation of that checkpoint. So the number of mitotic cells drops rapidly to a lower point and is maintained for longer than in the non-stem cells in two different populations here. So these differences in protein levels and phosphorylation are translating into differences in checkpoint function and DS double strand break repair function. But why is that happening? Why are they upregulating their DNA damage response? Well, something that we had observed and not really noticed very much uh, or taken much notice of originally was this phenomenon that within the stem-like population, we always saw a higher proportion of cells in S phase, even though the, the overall cell doubling time was very similar between the stem cells and the bulk populations. So we wanted to look at those S phase cells in a bit more detail. And we can identify them because they incorporate BRDU into their um, chromosomes. So we can see our S phase cells in the bulk population and the stem cell population 
And I hope you can see that in the stem cells, these S-phase cells express high levels of RPA, which is a replication stress protein. And not only that, but those cells which are expressing RPA are also exhibiting double strand breaks, even in the absence of radiation treatment. So something is happening during S phase, which is, means that the cells are taking longer to execute S phase. They're showing signs of replication stress and it's giving rise to double strand breaks. And we figured that these endogenously arising double strand breaks were activating the DNA damage response. And that was what was making these cells radio resistant. And that's just quantifying those data across different cell lines. The best way to look at replication stress is with the DNA fiber assay, where you sequentially uh, incorporate uh, cells um, with these analogs. Uh, so it's chlorodeoxyuridine and then subsequently iododeoxyuridine, which are, you can detect through the different colors. And you can look, actually look at the incorporation and the dynamics of DNA replication in different cell types. And just with the naked eye, I hope you can see that over the same period, the stem cell population are creating shorter tracts of DNA. So their DNA replication is slower. And you can measure that. And we did that across multiple different cell lines. And in every case, the, the velocity of DNA replication was lower in the stem cells than in the non-stem cells. And we also did some cell sorting experiments using CD133 to verify that. We also showed that there was higher levels of stalled replication forks in the stem cells, and also a higher proportion of asymmetric replication forks. And both of these are really readouts of dysfunctional, disrupted DNA replication. So something is causing dysfunctional DNA replication in our stem cell population, and that's activating the DNA damage response and making them radio resistant. That was all in vitro. We also looked in vivo, and here we used SOX2 as a marker of stem-like cells uh, and looked at levels of RPA protein uh, in, and the relative levels in the SOX2 positive and the SOX2 negative cells, and we see higher levels of replication stress in our SOX2 positive, in our xenograft models, and then in four different patient specimens here. And actually in our patient specimens, the difference was really mo even more marked than it was in our models. So we do think this is actually happening in vivo and is not just an artifact of cell culture. Why is it happening? Well, we can see that uh, at regions of the chromosomes that are incorporating lots of BRDU, these are sometimes referred to as replication factories, uh, we get generation of double strand breaks and we get co-localization of the BRDU hotspots and the gamma matrix in our stem cells, but not in our non-stem cells. So we think there are certain genes or regions of the genome that are particularly prone to aberrant DNA replication, and they give rise to double strand breaks. So Ross Carruthers, who's done most of this work and now uh, is setting up his own lab, is really on the search to find out where are these happening in the genome. Uh, and why uh, is that particularly apparent in the glioma stem cells? The cause of why these replication hotspots can give rise to double strand breaks seems to be related to R loops. So R loops are hybrid structures between RNA and DNA, and they occur with partly, or sometimes they occur when a cell is transcribing a gene and attempting to replicate that region of DNA at the same time. Clearly, that shouldn't be happening. Um, but this seems to be particularly common in the glioma stem cells, and we get co-localization of these R loops with the double strand breaks. So once again, this, is, this gives us a, an opportunity to try and localize where these are happening in the genome. And then the final bit of data on this subject, too, um, which was one of the reviewers' questions, which at the time you hate them for it, but subsequently you think, actually, that's made it a much better paper, uh, is, well, how can you prove that the replication stress is actually driving the radio resistance? So we induced replication stress in our non-stem cells by using low dose of fidicolin, sublethal doses for relatively short periods of time, and that was sufficient to cause an increase in radio resistance uh, across uh, all the cell lines that we looked at. So we're moderately confident that this 
radio resistance phenotype is driven predominantly by DNA replication stress via upregulation of the DNA damage response. So how does that help us in the clinic? Well, we've tested various different DNA repair inhibitors on our stem cell population, and most of them increase the radio sensitivity of those cells. So here are our stem-like cells, they're very radio resistant. We can get modest radio sensitization with PARP inhibitors, with a CHECK1 inhibitor, and with an ATR inhibitor. But we get very profound radio sensitization with our ATM inhibitor. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that's because it's inhibiting both cell cycle checkpoint function and double strand break repair to some extent. And if we do that with the ATM inhibitor, we get an enhancement ratio of about 2.5. And to put that into context, what that would mean is we normally give 60 gray to a GBM. If this is borne out in the clinic, this would be equivalent to giving 150 gray to a GBM, which surely would make some difference in survival. Okay, I'm gonna talk about PARP inhibitors now because that's where I have the most experience and we are the most advanced. PARP looks like a promising target in GBM because it's really overexpressed and it's hardly expressed at all in the normal brain. It's also overexpressed in our stem-like cells and in our experiments where we've compared the effects of PARP inhibitors on radio sensitivity of stem-like cells in pink and the non-stem cells in light blue, we see a bigger enhancement in our stem cell population than we do in the non-stem cell population, which we think might be related to this overexpression of PARP. The other thing that I, observation I made a long time ago uh, and has been shown by others as well, is that PARP inhibitors only increase radio sensitivity of cells that are actively replicating. So in this experiment by some colleagues in Paris, they synchronized cells in different phases of the cell cycle and showed that it was only the S phase cells that were radio sensitized. We looked across a panel of cell lines and showed that the enhancement ratio for the PARP inhibitor was proportional to the percentage of cells that were in S phase at the time of the experiment. And we also showed that we could abolish the radio sensitizing effect of the PARP inhibitor if we treated with a replication inhibitor just for one hour uh, at the time of radiation. And the, the mechanism is that um, the PARP inhibitor is, in, is delaying single strand break repair and in cells that are replicating, those excess single strand breaks get converted to double strand breaks. And you can see that in this gamma H2AX assay, where we see this excess of double strand breaks, the solid black bars, at four and 24 hours after radiation. But we only see it in G2 cells. In G1 cells, we see no impact of the PARP inhibitor on double strand break repair. So that process of DNA replication is converting unrepaired single strand breaks to double strand breaks. And we can totally block that effect if we block replication, again, just for that short period of time or after the radiation. So we thought we had a pretty good case for taking Olaparib into glioblastoma in combination with radiation. Uh, but AstraZeneca... Uh, had generated some fairly convincing data that this drug does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you look at these experiments using a, a radio-labeled olaparib molecule, you can see that it doesn't penetrate the central nervous system at all. There's no radiation detectable there whatsoever. My argument was that we know the blood-brain barrier is disrupted in GBM. And we can see that if we give contrast-enhancing agents to an MRI, so within the normal brain, the agent remains within the blood vessels, but in the tumor, because of the very disrupted blood-brain barrier, there's widespread leakage into the tumor tissue. They weren't convinced by that. They wanted us to demonstrate that the drug actually did get into the tumors. So this was the operatic study that Ranjit has mentioned. Uh, and one of the objectives of that was to look at that particular question. So we gave patients a lap rib for four doses immediately prior to a neurosurgical resection of their tumor. And in the 27 patients who had the resection, we got three samples on average from each patient, and we were able to detect a lap rib in 71 out of those 75 specimens. And you can see that there was quite a, a wide range of concentrations in different tumors. This is the average value from the three specimens from each tumor. No correlation whatsoever with 
blood levels of the drug, but we had a median concentration of about 500 nanomolars. Now the question then is, is that sufficient to give us radiosensitization? Well, one thing we know is that if you give a PARP inhibitor with radiation, the dose that you require or the concentration you require is significantly lower than if you're giving it as a single agent. And I haven't really got time to, to go into the mechanisms of that. So uh, my colleague Conchita Bentz in Amsterdam did some really nice studies where she took samples of blood and then tumor from patients and did an ex vivo irradiation step and then measured the effects of olaparib on PARP activity as measured by synthesis of polyADP ribose. And what she showed was that a dose of 50 nanomolar will give greater than 90% inhibition of PARP in all of the samples and all of the patients that they looked at. So all of our tumor samples showed levels comfortably above 50 nanomolar. So we are optimistic that that will be sufficient to give us radiosensitization. So we thought we'd answered that question, but then the reviewers once again uh, came to our rescue uh, and asked us to look at the tumor margins. They said, well, we could have told you all along that the olaparib will get into this contrast enhancing region of the tumor. What about those margin regions which have fewer tumor cells? They don't show florid contrast enhancement. The blood-brain barrier may be intact in those regions and you're not gonna deliver your drug to those crucial regions of the tumor. So we did a dose expansion cohort of 10 patients the, the surgeons used 5-ALA to get a complete resection of the solid tumor. And then when there was no fluorescing tumor remaining, they then took biopsies from the cavity walls, which we figured were the tumor margin regions. And again, the patients were given a laparib prior to that operation. And again, we showed the drug was present in all but one of those specimens and all of the patients. Interestingly, the median value, while slightly lower, if we looked did a comparison between margin and core. For each patient, the ratio was one. And I was really surprised by this result. It seems to suggest that even in the tumor margin, there is a sufficient disruption of the blood-brain barrier to deliver a laparib to these um, regions of the tumor. Again, a wide variation between patients, but all of them above that 50 nanomolar threshold. These are the tumor margin specimens that we obtained, and you can see that this is not solid tumor. We didn't, by chance, get a non-fluorescing bit of solid tumor. These are tumor margin regions where the percentage of tumor cells is really very low. The only um, correlation we can see is a very weak correlation between the uh, capillary area. We're staining our capillaries uh, there with CD31 and the plasma, I'm sorry, the tumor levels of a lapra, but it is a weak correlation. So we're looking to that a little bit further, but we are confident that we did get samples from the tumor margin and that the lapra is penetrating those um, regions of the tumor. And I think this has quite significance, not just for a lapra, but for brain tumor studies in general. And I'm hoping that pharmaceutical companies will be a bit more ready to test agents in these tumors, even if they don't think they're gonna cross the intact blood-brain barrier. I do think that when we are testing new agents, we should do these PK experiments. You only need a few patients. And if you can demonstrate that your drug's getting to the tumor, it makes interpreting all the results so much more uh, uh, illuminating. Um, one of the reasons we think that we might be getting this um, drug delivery in the tumor margins is that from our xenograft studies, we can see that tumor cells like to grow around blood vessels. And when they do that, we think that they uh, interfere with blood brain barrier integrity and that that then releases the drug into the tissue. Okay, so I'll give you some quick updates on the clinical trials that we're running, combining olaparib and radiotherapy. The first study we did was in elderly patients with GBM. This is the paradigm study. Uh, and we chose this group because at that time they didn't receive temozolomide. So we didn't need to incorporate temozolomide into the trial regimen. And also they standardly receive a slightly lower dose of radiation. So we felt that the risks, if there were any, would, would be more acceptable. So we did a phase one dose escalation study in this elderly group of GBM. 
And we really didn't see any additional toxicity from adding the PARP inhibitor to the radiation. Uh, and we were able to give a dose of Olaparib of 200 milligrams twice daily. We probably could have gone higher, but that was what we'd specified prior to the study as the, as the maximum dose we would test. And that's pretty close to the single agent dose of Olaparib, which is 300 milligrams twice daily. And just to put that into context, people have been using Olaparib in other tumor sites, lung cancer, head and neck cancer, for example. And they've really struggled to get um, significant doses of Olaparib into these patients. So for example, in the non-small cell lung cancer study in Amsterdam, they were only able to give 25 milligrams daily of Olaparib. And in the head and neck cancer study, they were able to give 50 milligrams daily. We're giving eight or 16 fold higher doses of Olaparib. And the difference is the normal tissues. What are the critical normal tissues? And in both of these settings, we have rapidly proliferating, acutely responding normal tissues within the radiation volume. So the esophagus for the lung cancer patients and the oral mucosa for the head and neck cancer patients. And we do see an exacerbation of that acute toxicity when we add olaparib. So this really supports the hypothesis that we've seen in the, in the models that PARP inhibitors potently radiosensitize replicating cells. But if the cells are not replicating, like in the normal brain, they do, it doesn't seem to have any impact. So this is a really good example of when you're combining a new drug with radiation. Yes, you want to think about the tumor effects, but you absolutely need to think about what the effects are going to be on the crucial normal tissues for that particular tumor. And actually, as we become more sophisticated in our radiotherapy planning, if we can predict which tissues or organs are going to give us problems, we can think about shifting our doses so that we, for example, for the lung cancer patients, reduce doses to the esophagus where possible. Um, so I'm really excited about this area, actually, and I think we need to be quite sophisticated in the way we develop here uh, and use the radiotherapy technology we have to give us the best chance of incorporating the new agents. So we've done our dose escalation study. We're now doing a randomized phase two study in the elderly patients uh, who are getting 40 grain 15 fractions plus a laparib or placebo. And um, we are open in 19 centers in the UK and recruiting reasonably well to that study. At the same time, we've been looking in the younger patients aged under 70, good performance patient status patients. And this is paradigm two. And here we have had to think about temozolomide because this is standard of care for these younger patients. And the way we've handled this is to separate the patients according to MGMT status. So the MGMT methylated patients, we know they benefit from temozolomide. So we're giving that standard regime with daily temozolomide, 60 gray in 30 fractions. But we also know that when we add PARP inhibitors to temozolomide, we see an increase in bone marrow toxicity. And it's quite an important increase. And it's an on-target effect. So we can't avoid it. So here we have to be very cautious with our elaparib dosing. And at the moment, we're just giving it one day a week during that six-week cycle. In the MGMT unmethylated patients, we know that they don't really benefit from temozolomide. So we can withhold the temozolomide, and that enables us to give much higher doses of elaparib and give it on a daily basis. So we're still doing the dose escalation study here. And the unmethylated cohort is going extremely smoothly. We haven't seen any additional toxicity, just as with the elderly patients. And we're about to open cohort five, which will be the full single agent dose, 300 milligrams twice daily. In contrast, our methylated cohort, you can see we are already struggling with bone marrow toxicity. Uh, so we're having to give low doses once a week. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure whether that is going to fly. I'm uh, going to give it a bit more uh, chance, and we've modified our DLT criteria slightly. So I perhaps see the place for Olaparib in our MGMT unmethylated population, where we don't need to worry about the temozolomide effect. Some potential biomarkers for uh, the patients who are going to derive the most benefit from the PARP inhibitors. Well, PARP expression itself might be a useful biomarker. And a simple biomarker of proliferation might also be of interest. I've shown you that data. And we do see quite a range of P67 indices in our GBM patients. Some of them have very, very high levels of replication, others much lower. 
Uh, and we've done an initial analysis on our paradigm phase one patients, and they did cluster into patients with low levels of Q67 and patients with high levels. And in this cohort, the patients with high levels of proliferation actually lived longer than the patients with lower levels. It's obviously a small sample, but all of these patients got the combination of a lap ribbon radiation. So we're going to continue to investigate that. I don't have time to go into it today, but we have shown in the past that if tumor cells have a variety of different defects in their DDR, then in general, the radiosensitizing effects of the PARP inhibitor are enhanced. So we want to look at signatures of DDR function or dysfunction in our tumors to see whether that correlates with the benefit from adding in the PARP inhibitor. And one way to do that is to do whole genome sequencing and get readouts of sort of global genomic instability. And you can see tumors with relatively stable genomes and tumors with very unstable genomes. And we think that those unstable genomes are more sensitive or more sensitized by PARP inhibitors. But this is quite a complex area and there's quite a bit more work to do. To finish off um, the talk, I'm just going to talk a bit more about ATM inhibitors. They are extremely potent radiosensitizers. They're particularly active in these glioma stem cell populations. And other people have shown the same in different models, very potent radiosensitization, both in vitro and also in vivo in orthotopic GBM models. This is Chris Valerie in um, Richmond, Virginia. AstraZeneca, on the basis of this data, have done something a little bit unprecedented and actually developed a specific brain penetrant ATM inhibitor uh, for use in brain tumor patients. Uh, and they've just published this paper in Science Advances. It's a really good paper, I think. What they've shown in the cell lines is very impressive radiosensitization, which in their hands is particularly present in P53 mutant cell lines. In their P53 wild type cell lines, they see much less radiosensitization. Now, we haven't observed this in our patient derived models. Um, we see radiosensitization of 2.5 and above in all of our models, regardless of P53 status. So I think there is, we need to look more into this P53 story in terms of ATM inhibitors. But I think perhaps these established glioma cell lines, which are truly P53 wild type and the whole pathway is intact, uh, may be slightly unrepresentative of, of the situation in patients. And that's borne out by um, the data from this paper, where they've taken six different patient-derived cells, put them straight into mouse brain, and then done in vivo studies. And in all of them, they see that the ATM inhibitor promotes tumor growth delay and survival of the mice, again, regardless of P53 status. So um, we need to understand that a bit better, but that's very encouraging. And on the basis of this, uh, I'm delighted to be the co-chief investigator on this phase one study of this new ATM inhibitor. So it's, I think, as far as I'm aware, a first. It's a first in human study of a drug, an ATM inhibitor, that is being tested in that first in human trial in combination with radiotherapy and in patients with brain tumors, which marks a bit of a turnaround from the past when the radiation oncologists would be the last people to get their hands on a drug. And then even within that group, the ones treating brain tumors would be even further down the queue. So this is really exciting. We're doing a first in human study of this drug, which has been specifically developed for brain tumors. It doesn't have any single agent activity. It's a potent radiosensitizer. So we're testing it with radiation. And we're looking at it in three different types of patients. And I'll just show you the study design. The first group of patients is patients with recurrent GBM. We're giving them a modest dose of radiation, 35 gray and 10 fractions. The second group will be brain metastases who are not suitable for stereotactic treatment. And they'll get whole brain radiotherapy. Again, a modest dose, 30 gray and 10 fractions with the drug. And if they go well, we'll move on to patients with newly diagnosed MGMT unmethylated GBM. It's a clever design for a first in human study. So the first patients would get a single dose of the drug, then they have their radiation over two weeks, and then they'd get two weeks of adjuvant therapy. And we've now moved on to, uh, we've just 
we're recruiting to this cohort who are getting doses twice weekly concomitant with radiotherapy as well as adjuvantly and so far seems to be well tolerated. So I'll summarize uh, to end the talk. Um, I think it's really clear now that the DNA damage response is upregulated in GBM stem-like cells and we have shown that that is caused by replication stress. Along with that hypothesis, we've shown that DDR inhibitors, many different ones, can overcome the radio resistance of GBM stem-like cells, both in vitro and in vivo. We've shown in the clinic that Alaprib does penetrate GBM despite not crossing the intact blood-brain barrier. And the Alaprib radiotherapy combination is really well tolerated in these patients. We're working on some candidate biomarkers for patient selection. And we're also excited to be introducing some of the other DDR inhibitors, such as the ATM inhibitor, into early clinical development. So I'll just thank uh, some of the people who helped me with this work, uh, ranging from the lab, my old lab in Sussex, the whole of the UK brain tumor research community, Cancer Research UK, and AstraZeneca. And I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.